بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters in Islam it gives me great pleasure today to stand before you and address you about uh, the importance of the sunnah in our lives. Now initially I was thinking that you know the best thing to do is to compile the traditional ayat and a hadith about the importance of the seerah, the importance of the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. But to be honest, I believe that for the most part we know these ayat and a hadith. And so I wanted to actually get to something which was a little bit more practical, a little bit more tangible in our uh, daily lives. And that is that one of the greatest challenges that we are facing in our times is the onslaught that we currently face against our scripture, against our sharia, against our Quran and sunnah vis-a-vis Western culture, um, you know, the, uh, the intellect, uh, common sense, human rights. In other words, there seems to be a contradiction. There seems to be uh, a, a, a dichotomy between on the one hand quote unquote human values or freedom or or or, or progressive uh, progression and on the other hand the sharia and the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and there really and truly there really and truly is a clash of i don't want to call it civilizations but definitely a clash of morals a clash of cultures a clash of what's right and wrong and so instead of just giving you vague and abstract ayat and a hadith about the importance of the sunnah we all know that i wanted to go into a little bit of a tangent about what is the meaning and why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given us an intellect? What is the purpose of intellect in our religion? Because one of the main things that occurs, you read a hadith or you read a verse of the Quran, you read the sunnah and you say, you know, that doesn't make sense to me. How can this be my religion? And there seems to be a clash. There seems to be a rejection. So we have one of two options. The first of these options, for the, we think we have one of two options. The first of these options is we say, this is the sunnah and it's got to be correct and my mind must be, you know, totally incorrect and let me just, you know, leave it at that. Let me ask no questions. And we become like the Christians who when they're set, when they ask questions, their priests tell them, don't ask, just believe. Okay, and the other extreme is if there seems to be a contradiction, we say, I know Allah has given me an intellect. It cannot go against the sunnah. And so I have to give precedence to what I think is true, what really and truly my common sense tells me. This is the other extreme. Okay, now these are theoretical and abstract realities. You can apply them in your daily lives to a million and one scenarios and situations. Anytime there appears to be a clash, anytime there appears to be a, a confusion, a dichotomy, it's either the sunnah or my common sense, then this topic applies to you. And my, the, the purpose of this topic, inshaAllah ta'ala, is to provide us the, the intellectual and theological background to help us understand why has Allah sent down the sharia and why has he given us an aql? In Arabic, the word for intellect is aql. Okay, and I'm going to be using this word a lot. So why has Allah given us an intellect and sent down a sharia? So that they clash one another or what? Now I'm going to talk about a number of issues. Uh, first and foremost, why are we talking about this topic? Secondly, what does the Quran tell us about intellect and reason? Common sense. Thirdly, what are the dangers of going to extremes in this issue? And then I'll conclude with a comprehensive conclusion and inshallah try to um, tie in some aspects of, of leadership with that. So firstly, why are we talking about this, uh, this topic? I think I've already alluded to the fact that in my humble opinion, the primary battle that we as Muslims are facing now is an identity crisis. What does it mean to be a Muslim? And that identity crisis centers around a clash of, as I put it, morals, a clash of values, a clash of intellects. It's either the sharia or, you know, human rights and common sense and, and, and progressiveness. That's the way we look at it. And I think that this is really and truly the crisis of modern times, especially for the Western ummah, more so than any other ummah. Also, we're entering a scientific era. In fact, we're not just entering it, we're kind of reaching the, the, the apex of it. And there's an ever-increasing emphasis on the role of science, 
on the role of, of technology, on the role of, of, of the intellect. And traditional values are being challenged, re-examined. People are, 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 are asking for a fresh look at Islam. The key buzzword in all Muslim circles without exception is ijtihad. That's the key buzzword. Ijtihad. Everybody's calling for ijtihad. We want to re-evaluate things that were never asked for to be re-evaluated um, before. And so it is of paramount importance that we as leaders of the future of the ummah try to reach a harmony, try to reach an understanding. What is the role of the sunnah and what is the role of my intelligence, my aql that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me? Now, Allah has mentioned the word aql in the Qur'an more than 60 times. Aql and its derivatives. There are many derivatives and synonyms of aql. Of them is fiqh. Fiqh, many people think fiqh means legal theory. In fact, fiqh means understanding. And, the, and this is really an, a, key, a key term in our religion. Why has Allah called legal sciences fiqh? Because this is the key to understanding. Likewise, fakkara, yufakkiru, dhakkara. All of this aql, all of this means to think, to contemplate. We've all heard, and I guarantee you at least a dozen times we've heard, the Qur'an challenges us to think. The Qur'an wants us to ponder, to reflect. We've heard this dozens or hundreds of times. However, I dare state in, in rather a, a blunt way, I don't think that the people who say this have actually gone through the Qur'an and looked at the context of these verses. Looked at when does Allah ask us to think and who is he addressing when he asks us to think and ponder. And uh, alhamdulillah, I have gone through the Quran with this goal in mind. And I've categorized the verses. Generally, I'm sure that others can do other categories, but I've categorized the verses into a number of different categories. When does Allah ask us to think and ponder? Because you see, there are other verses that ask us to not think but submit. In fact, the very verses that the brother just recited, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ الْأَرِفْ لَا مِيمُ ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي هُدَى لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ The fundamental characteristic of the believer, in the second verse in the Qur'an, he believes in the unseen. Belief. And so in certain verses, blind faith is praised, belief in the unseen. And in other verses, Allah is challenging us to think and ponder and reflect. Is there a contradiction or not? This is what we have to answer right now. Now, the first category of verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks a certain group of people to think is related to the fact He wants us to ponder over the fact that there is one creator and only one creator. So He's challenging mankind to think about a very specific issue. He's challenging atheists and agnostics. He's challenging those who worship a plurality of gods to think. How many gods are there? Challenge your minds, use the, the brains that Allah has given you and come to the conclusion that La ilaha illallah, there is only one God and only He is worthy of worship. Of these verses, Surah Al-Rum, verse 8, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَلَمْ يَتَفَكَّرُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ don't they think 